Chief Executive of Volunteering Matters, Una began her career in teaching before working in the Education Directorate of Strathclyde Regional Council and holding senior posts in Glasgow and Fife Councils. Her work with the local government association focused on improving children's services and co-managing the Aging Well programme. Una's talking today about the transformative power of volunteering and how it can help maintain individual and community health and promote social inclusion. So please welcome Una Aitken. Well, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you so much for that introduction, Leslie, um, and thank you to the Museums Opp Association uh, for giving me this opportunity to make a contribution to your conference. I feel really honoured to be in, in, uh, in the, speaker, the keynote speaker's lineup. Um, I, after, I was very glad yesterday evening that I didn't have to follow Jackie Kay after her fantastic uh, contribution. Um, and I really wish I had thought up that line about pouring a glass of water and linking it to the Edinburgh Festival fringe. And those among you who do a bit of public speaking will probably be like me thinking, I'm definitely going to use that line sometime, but I can't use it this morning to you because you've heard it. Um, I'm also really pleased to have been invited back to Glasgow when you're having your conference here again. Um, I grew up about seven miles from here. Um, I went to university in Glasgow and, and I started my teaching career um, just outside the city. So it's, it's great to be back. And I also feel a bit of a connection with the, the Museums Association because at one point in my career, I had strategic responsibility for community services, among a lot of other things, in Fife Council. And that included the museum service. <clears throat> um, and I really loved that aspect of the job. Um, and one of the highlights, or the highlight perhaps, of my time there um, was meeting Jack Vetriano. Um, and this was just at the height of the Vetriano versus the art establishment. Um, so, Bridget, if you're here at the conference, a belated thank you for that, uh, that uh, meeting. However, I'm here to talk to you about the future of volunteering. I believe that volunteering changes lives, and you believe that museums change lives. Museums enrich the lives of individuals and contribute to strong and resilient communities and, to, and help to create a fair and just society. We believe that volunteering is an expression of active citizenship and contributes to the democratic fabric of our society. My contribution today will try to bring these two things together. Uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you a bit about Volunteering Matters and our priorities. Many of you may know the, the organization as Community Service Volunteers. Uh, we rebranded in 2015. And then I'll, I'll move on to volunteering and how it might be developing in the future. So I'm going to begin my contribution with a short video. Volunteering matters to us because we know everyone has a valuable role to play through volunteering. We recruit, train and support thousands of volunteers across the UK to provide invaluable support and services, helping to build strong, inclusive communities. We focus on social action volunteering, creating supportive relationships that really matter. We provide lifelines for the over 50s who may feel isolated and lonely. We support local services such as patients' driving schemes and use the valuable life skills of older people in schools and to mentor the young. Young volunteers are essential to their communities. They lead peer projects in local areas such as getting older people online and befriending those in care homes. We put our volunteers at the heart of family life. We help improve parenting skills to create happier families. We also provide support for families with children at risk of neglect or harm or those who have life-limiting illnesses. We enable people, whatever their disability, to actively volunteer in their local area, improving their confidence, quality of life and employability. Our volunteers also support and mentor disabled people to help them live independently. 
Employee volunteering programs are a powerful way to connect businesses to their local communities. Our established team helps create opportunities to match your employees to areas of greatest need nationwide. Volunteering matters. We impact communities across the UK. Volunteering matters. So I hope that gives you a sense of who we are and what we do. Um, we've been as CSV and as, as Volunteering Matters through a huge amount of transition and positive change over the last two years. I've been Chief Executive for two of these years and spent the previous two as Director of Social Action and Volunteering, Policy, Fundraising, Europe, Communications and Marketing. Now, I can laugh at that now, it's a huge remit, but at the time, it was really an impossible job, and one in which I felt I, I really never gave enough focus to anything. The reason for this wide range of responsibilities was that the other side of the business was learning. We had 11 learning centres across the UK. Unfortunately, we were, we were losing a lot of money at that point because the learning market had changed and we were not sufficiently competitive. So in order to survive as an organisation, we had to close all our learning operations and concentrate on social action and volunteering. Fortunately for us, we also had some London property to sell and that allowed us to refinance and refocus the charity. All of this is well documented in a variety of articles at the time and by a Charity Commission case study, um, yes, we had a visit from the Charity Commission when they clocked our lack of reserves um, but the visit went very well. We had then, and we still have, a tremendously engaged and committed chair and board of trustees. Uh, and they worked with us throughout the transformation, so they were able to speak knowledgeably to the Charity Commission um, about how governance had played a major part in the transformation. So there were another, a few other transformation must-dos, which I'll just mention quickly. Um, investing in income generation and business development, the rebrand that I mentioned, which has been hugely successful and has given us positive feedback from uh, volunteers, beneficiaries, stakeholders. Um, and also, and this will be very important to you, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, uh, investing in impact measurement and evaluation. So after I took over, um, I didn't really feel that we were a confident or stable enough organisation to put out a long-term plan. So we developed these three strategic priorities. They're all equally important to us, but we've had a bit of a focus in the last six months on the one in the middle, listening to our volunteer voices and ensuring that they're, they're heard. Um, and we've also used these volunteer voices as a way of securing uh, income. Um, and uh, I was speaking to Sharon yesterday about a talk I gave um, to Cass in London quite a few months ago now. Um, and I talked at the, in that, uh, that contribution about how we used the voice of volunteers to demonstrate social impact to our funders and stakeholders. Because we were struggling really to find a good way of making sure that funders and stakeholders understood the social impact of our volunteers not just for the beneficiaries, but for the volunteers themselves, and actually getting volunteers to tell their story in their words and really from the heart has a huge, huge impact and really demonstrates so clearly the social impact that, that it has for them and for the communities. So I'll say more about volunteers a bit later. We're still focused on these priorities, but now we feel confident and stable enough to think about a three-year forward view. And our focus in that forward view is on these three words. We're an ambitious organisation. We don't want to stand still. We want to continue to lead UK volunteering in policy and practice, because the kind of volunteering that we're involved in changes lives. The people who volunteer with us tell us that they want to transform lives. They want to commit to regular volunteering. They want to see that they're transforming lives. So we want to be able to provide these kinds of volunteering opportunities for people. We still focus on four pillars and on employee volunteering. And as you can see, the pillars are pretty all-encompassing. 
older and retired people, young people, families and disabled people. And our employee volunteering team work with 50 plus co corporate clients and provide opportunities for their employees to work as teams or, or as, as individuals within our own programmes or those of many other charities. So I'm just going to go back to my last slide, if I can. We're a creative organisation. As far as the development of our offers is concerned, we need to evolve and innovate. We have some really good models across all of our pillars, and you saw some examples of that in the video. The work our volunteers do is very much co-produced with their beneficiaries. So, for example, our retired and senior volunteer programme, RSVP, is almost entirely volunteer-led. Older people in their own communities want to fix something. They see an issue and they want to sort it. They organise themselves. We have around 400, 480 volunteer organisers working with around 15,000 volunteers. I was recently in Bristol to meet some of the RSVP organisers there and they run all sorts of programmes. They organise lay assessors in care homes and with home care. They run driving schemes, they run knitting groups, they run social prescri prescribing, they run reading programmes in schools, just to mention a few things. In three London boroughs, our Young People's Programme, Positive Futures, runs on the same model. Young people want to give something back to the community, and they come up with their own ideas for volunteering projects. To date, after starting the project just in this April, uh, we've engaged more than 300 young volunteers. Just last week, I attended the screening of a film for Black History Month, developed by a group of volunteers who engaged with some local uh, older ladies in, in a community centre in Hackney to weave into their film the experiences of a generation who arrived in London after the Caribbean, from the Caribbean after World War II. The young people wanted to develop a programme that involved intergenerational work and which reflected the life of their neighbourhood. And I should have asked them if they engaged with the local museum to get some of the, the pictures and the film footage that they wove into their film. Our volunteers support families, families usually that are just coping or where perhaps there's a child protection issue. They work alongside professional social workers and they support the families to make their lives less chaotic, to get the children out to school or just to talk through the, the problems with the parents. They're a non-judgmental extra support which is not part of the statutory service. But they don't impose their solutions on the families. They talk through the issues and they work with parents and children and they work with the parents and children to find out what will work for them. Full-time and part-time volunteers support young people and older people with learning difficulties to lead independent lives and to make choices about these lives. It might be as simple as how to spend their spare time or it might be supporting them to take up a volunteering opportunity or work experience. We're going to hear from some of these people at the very end of my contribution. But we want to do some new things too. We're soon going to start a campaign to attract more young people from the UK to full-time volunteering. The full-time volunteering programme was Community Service Volunteers' flagship and it's actually how the charity started. There may even be some CSVs in the audience. Is there anyone who was a CSV? There always is. Um, I'd love to meet you afterwards because we're looking for some ambassadors for our programme. Uh, we're not going to be asking you for money. We just like uh, a few people who were CSVs to talk about their experience and what it meant for them. And if it changed your, <coughs> excuse me, if it changed your life in some way. And only yesterday I was visiting our programme in North Lanarkshire. It's a, a mentoring and befriending programme for, for school-age young people. And we have two full-time volunteers there. And one of them's a young man called Harry. Um, and he was very proud to tell me that both his dad and his uncle had been CSVs in the 1980s. That made me feel incredibly old. Um, so uh, we're, uh, we're thinking through how we're going to manage that campaign. We're also looking at whether we can offer a school-age volunteering opportunity, which would give volunteers that journey through volunteering at school, certainly in England through the National C Citizen Service, and then perhaps moving into full-time volunteering, employee volunteering, and then employing, um, volunteering in retirement. So you can see a complete journey for people in the UK being able to take up these opportunities. Just 
make technology work. So we want to grow as a charity, not just in terms of turnover, but also in terms of volunteers and beneficiaries. And we want to grow as an organization. We want to recruit and retain, as I'm sure you do, creative, flexible, enthusiastic staff who feel valued and recognized by the organization. And we're about to open our second annual staff survey this week. So as you see from this slide, some quite interesting statistics. 21 people volunteer regularly in the UK, um, and 31 people say that they volunteer annually. And from these statistics, 18 million people have said that they do formal volunteering, and 27 million do informal volunteering. And these are stats from the Community Life Survey. So what makes the world of volunteering tick? Well, here's some of our volunteer voices and beneficiary voices. Um, Chris is a young man with a physical disability and his full-time volunteer has supported him through university. And um, Bob that you see on the, the right hand there is, uh, is part of uh, one of our RSVP programs in the Fourth Valley here in Scotland. He and a team of volunteers do simple jobs, generally for older people, changing light bulbs and curtains, small-scale plumbing, moving furniture, that sort of thing. And they've now extended their service into befriending. So they spot isolated older people and they link them up with a befriender who can visit for a chat. There's a stat that I'm really proud of that you don't see there, but it comes into that third uh, quote. 100% of the social workers that we work with would recommend our service. So why do people volunteer? Well, rather than me uh, tell you why I think they volunteer, um, I'm going to let you hear our community volunteers in Coventry and their relatives um, talk about what motivates them and what they get from volunteering. We've started this project mostly because we wanted to bring the community together. I feel that my contribution to the community should be, they pay me a pension, I should do something in return. So I do people's bins, I do this sort of work and it gives me a sort of sense of satisfaction. It's self-satisfaction, nobody needs to acknowledge it. And it's just basically good community work, enjoyable for me, the results are very good for the community. The difference this project has made is that we've now got an area of 47 acres which is accessible, which is safe and which is usable in a variety of ways. Virtually one time the woods you couldn't go through them between November and March because <coughs> it was so muddy. And it's just so much more accessible now. There's open spaces here uh, which, and flooring stuff down on the floor so it's not as muddy as it was. Lots of people can use it. It's brilliant. Oh, I'm very proud of her. I'm quite I'm surprised in a good way of how much it's progressed as well. Um, but yeah, very proud of her. And also, I was doing a fashion and textiles degree, um, and she taught me how to knit for that as well. Uh, one of the projects it was to teach herself a new skill. Um, so I sat in with my grandma for a few weeks, and it helped with my degree as well. So it's been beneficial in that way as well as obviously raising money for charity. Uh, when I retired, um, I took some time to myself and after that uh, the novelty wore out, being out of work and having leisure time. So I decided to give something back to the community. Part, part of gardening in the park is actually doing for somebody else. We're always getting people stopping and they're saying, oh, you're doing a great job and, you know, well done and all this lot. And, and it, it really makes you feel great. You know, it, it gives you an up. For my own welfare, uh, I feel a lot better for it. And I, I feel good for helping the community. It has changed me a lot. It, it gives me a, given me a pleasure to know that I can give something to the community. It makes me very active also because I'm in that age myself. I have become active, I have learned to connect with the others. It gives me great pleasure. I think there's more need for volunteer groups now because as places like the councils are cutting back and things, I think there's, 
there's more people needed to, to help fill in some of those gaps, especially if they've got time on their hands. The volunteers are really passionate and they're, they're passionate about what they're doing and they're doing something that is needed in the community. RSVP encourages people to give back to their communities and there's a great deal of pleasure in giving back to the community that you grew up in and seeing it flourish it's like watering the plants in the garden it has to be done it's a boring task at times but the results eventually can be quite spectacular So now it's about you as well as about us. Um, when I was uh, researching and thinking about this presentation, I came upon a blog on the Museums Association website and I found this paragraph which really resonated with me. Museums need to get to grips with the new world. We need to take a deep dive into the real consequences of Brexit and the new political landscape for our governance and operations and for our duties of service to our communities. We need to ask some searching questions about whether our own agendas have been as progressive as we had hoped. We need the critical and ethical fortitude to recognize and reject what has become hollow and to embrace a progressive agenda with real substance. We need the courage to engage more deeply and more meaningfully with communities that appear to have taken a step back from us and to give them a voice. There are hateful alternatives waiting in the shadows if we don't. Real engagement and real self-awareness will require museums to take some brave new steps. Thank you, Nat Edwards, if you're here. So these are my challenges for all of us. And if we embrace them, we'll be demonstrating real engagement and the brave new steps that Nat mentioned. Social justice is at the heart of all of, of what we all do. We want to increase positive social change and improve people's lives and so do you in the museum service. Your association's vision is all about social impact and so is volunteering matters. So how can we achieve this through the power of volunteering in an ever-changing world? We have a very different demographic coming up. People may have to work for longer and people in the 55 plus age group may not have much, as much time for volunteering as they once did. They might have both childcare and elderly caring responsibilities. So where will we get our volunteers? Can we look to a younger age group? Or can we flex our opportunities so that we break down barriers to volunteering and we give people an easier opportunity to volunteer? I'm going to use our recent volunteer survey, which we did earlier this year. It's not comprehensive, it's not a massive uh, uh, sample, but I think it gives you a picture of volunteering from which we can extrapolate a number of ideas. Of the volunteers who completed our survey, 70% were female and 30% were male. How can we get more men volunteering? In our survey, 18% of the respondents were under 25, 44% in the 25 to 54 age group, and 37% over 55. Larger surveys suggest that more young people are volunteering and our middle-aged group statistic is confirmed as a growing area. But perhaps one of the most important aspects of looking at demographics is not really how often people volunteer, but what they want to get out of their volunteering. Back to social impact. Our volunteers, no matter their age group, consistently tell us they want to change people's lives, make an impact in their own community, and also get some sense of that impact. So understand what their volunteering is doing in the community. So that's our challenge. Develop, developing the sorts of volunteering opportunities that can satisfy the ambitions of the volunteers as well as the community, the beneficiaries or the organization. I was fascinated by the discussion yesterday on social mobility. And many aspects of it really resonated with me 
Um, and I, I sent out a tweet that said, basically, the same rules apply for volunteers. It leads me to diversity. Who are our volunteers and who's missing? Most of our older volunteers are white and middle class, except where our programs target a specific community, such as the older Asian women you saw in the film, or in our London programs where we have lots of young black volunteers. However, these young people are the achievers, and the older people are generally the ones who are already engaged in their communities. Where are the disabled people, the migrants, the carers, those with fewer opportunities or challenging backgrounds? Where are the unemployed people and those on lower incomes? We have a real problem attracting young people with fewer opportunities to volunteering and attracting people of all ages and abilities who don't think volunteering is for them. Similarly, I think from what I've heard in the short time I've been here, you're facing the same kind of challenges. Older, white, middle-class ex-professionals volunteering and indeed the same people who visit museums and galleries seeing themselves reflected in the volunteers. However, I do know there are some really good models out there. Um, we heard about one in the session yesterday and I was just watching the video shortly before I spoke and there are, yes, there are lots of other, uh, there are lots of examples of other kinds of programs uh, out there. But there's no easy answer or quick fix. Some of the pro problem is structural and it won't be fixed by us. But we can offer opportunities, I think, that speak to the un underrepresented groups in our area of work. We can be flexible, we can make our opportunities attractive and easy to access. We can be welcoming in a very non-judgmental way. We need to change. In my own organisation, we've run a full-time volunteering format in the same way for about 50 years. It's no wonder that we can't get a diverse cross-section of young people from the UK to join up. Until very recently, you had to live away from home. Not everyone wants to do that. You had to commit to six months or a year. Not everyone wants to do that. We're involved in something called European Volunteering for All. And that's trying to get young people with fewer opportunities involved in volunteering in another European country. There are really successful schemes in many countries, but specifically in France and Germany. Why are they successful? because they provide support and preparation and they allow access to employability skills. We would love to have the capacity to do that kind of thing for our young people. And I was, I was just thinking as I was preparing this uh, contribution that maybe if we could get a funder interested, that's where we could work together to change the lives of disadvantaged, disaffected young people with no history of either volunteering or engaging with the local museum. Maybe some of you are already doing that kind of thing, but can you imagine the social impact of such a programme across the UK? What about disabled people? How many opportunities do they have to volunteer? Virtually none, unless they are really well supported and, and access to their volunteering opportunity is easy. I'm going to come on to supporting volunteers in a moment because it's probably the most important thing and the most challenging aspect of being more diverse. However, on to digital. Are we doing everything we can communicate with our volunteers in the way that they want? Have we invested in our Facebook pages? Do we tweet about our opportunities and our successes? Do we celebrate our, so our volunteers on social media? Are we all producing e-bulletins and maintaining up-to-date, attractive, easy-to-use web pages? Can people see and hear volunteers who are like themselves? And development. Do we offer our volunteers opportunities to develop their roles with us? As I said, one of our most successful programmes is our SVP. You've already heard from some of our older volunteers. As I said earlier, we have more than 450 organisers, and most of them started as volunteers and then decided that they could do more. A great development opportunity, and we're trying to do the same for our young volunteers. Give them responsibility. Let them sort out problems. Let them liaise with the places we place our volunteers and be real ambassadors for the organisation. We try to bring our volunteers together from time to time, but that takes financial and staff capacity. I never tire of saying that volunteering is a free gift of time and energy, but it doesn't come free. 
and securing funds that can build capacity in our organisations and our sector could basically be the subject of a whole new talk. But our volunteers love to come together in conferences, support groups, and they love to have opportunities to share good practice and ideas. And we need to continue to hear and listen to their voices. So how do we keep our volunteers happy? How do we get them to volunteer with us and stay with us? I guess it depends on the kinds of volunteering opportunities you offer, but in our case, as I keep saying, our volunteers want to change lives. And to do that, they know that they need to commit to the organisation and, and to the programme for a significant amount of time. So our recruitment processes reflect that. We make it very clear that they need to make a commitment. We have clear role descriptions. And now the volunteers are asking for a review of their work, which astonished me. I met a group of organisers in the southwest recently who were asking me, how do we know we're doing a good job? How do you know we're doing a good job? They were saying that they needed to think about succession planning um, and reviewing how they work. We support our volunteers, we make them feel valued, we give them training if they're involved in an area that requires it. For example, our volunteers who support vulnerable families have three days of training, some delivered but from our own staff and some from the local authority they're working with. This also allows, allows them to make a decision about whether this volunteering opportunity is for them. Our grand mentors who support young people leaving the care system also receiving, receive training. And both groups have ongoing individual and group support from our staff and, of course, from each other. Our full-time volunteers have a member of staff who, look, who looks after them, irons out any problems and checks in with them regularly. Where appropriate, we give our volunteers letters of thanks and certificates. We bring them together to celebrate their volunteering. Just two examples. Earlier this year, we celebrated the disabled volunteers who are supported by full-time volunteers. Many of their parents were also at the ceremony, and you can imagine how delighted they were to see their son or daughter with learning difficulties come up and get a certificate uh, which celebrated all the hours of volunteering that they'd put in. Our grand mentors and their mentees have an annual visit to the House of Lords for a celebration of their volunteering and a tea party. Many studies have shown that volunteering and social action can be of value in terms of improving the health and well-being of people of all ages, backgrounds and circumstances, and in particular for some of the most excluded and vulnerable members of our society. It can, it can develop a sense of belonging for migrants uh, and illustrate the values and aspirations shared between migrants and established communities. Experimental and cohort studies show that participation in volunteering is strongly associated with better health, lower mortality, better functioning, life satisfaction, and decrease in depression. For young people, volunteering and social action can be empowering, build confidence, offer pathways into employment, and perhaps most importantly, be fun. Two weeks ago, we had our annual Volunt Europe conference in Nantes, uh, Volunteer Europe is a network of volunteer-involving organisations from all across the EU and beyond, which we manage. And in fact, if anybody's here from Millen Team Glasgow Life, they're a member of Volunteer Europe. This year, the conference theme was Apathy or Action, Young Europeans Take a Stand. And it was almost entirely led by young people. Young volunteers from France, Spain, Greece, Finland, Lithuania and Ipswich led workshops on a variety of topics important to them, street homelessness, sexual health, environmental issues, and so on. The way in which they described what volunteering and social action to, had brought to them was inspirational. It had brought them fun. They felt they were making an impact. They had learned new skills. Their horizons had been widened. But most of all, they felt better in themselves. They had healthier human relationships and they had fun again. I think my final film uh, this morning will demonstrate to you the sense of purpose, well-being, and satisfaction our learning disabled volunteers get from their volunteering activities. 
I don't think we should underestimate the power of volunteering and social action to create community cohesion. And with everything that's gone on in the last few months in the UK to divide our communities, I think we need this more than ever. I've talked about the, the effect on your health and well-being that volunteering and social action can have. We need to shout this a bit louder. If it's so good for you, why can't we get more people doing it? Especially for young people, but also for older people, volunteering and social action can increase employability skills, open up worlds that they maybe didn't even know exist, existed. And volunteering and social action, I believe, can be a, a force for inclusion. If we work hard enough to keep our existing volunteers, but recruit more volunteers and support more, more volunteers from migrant communities, harder to reach groups, and people from, for, of all ages and, and all ages and abilities, it can really be that force for social action and inclusion. Surely volunteering together can do something to combat fear of the other and fear of difference. And I've talked a lot about how volunteering can have social impact as well as have that re reciprocal benefit for the volunteers. I know this is really important to you as managers of museums, seeking to have a greater social impact and be better connected to communities. What better way to harness the creativity and contrib contribution of all the members of these communities than through volunteering. I want to finish my contribution with a few quotes from our own volunteering survey, but I'm sure if you surveyed your volunteers, you would have the same kind of statements. So somebody who is, who's volunteering uh, in the Grand Mentor Scheme said, it's the mental health side of it, it brings you out. In one of our projects where we try to lure older men in through sporting activities to volunteer. Um, they said, many of the men are divorced, widowed. It gives them friends, and friends can be better than family. One of the uh, volunteers, again in our Grand Mentors project, I, I'm pretty sure, said, volunteering has increased the, my insight into the problems people face and my understanding of myself. I have gained patience and the ability to take a calm approach to life. Another volunteer said, during my time here, I not only gained the experience, but also the opportunity to help others, hone my skills along with helping me to work outside my comfort zone and strive within it. Because of volunteering matters, could be any organization, I gained confidence when I was lacking due to not being able to find work. Someone, another volunteer said, I hope that my years of having been involved with a young person as the only consistent person in their life life uh, have given her a feeling of self-worth and being valued. This has also had an impact on my feeling of self-work too. I believe that our joint vision is of a society where everyone can participate in their local community through volunteering and social action. We all believe in the reciprocal nature of volunteering and the difference that it makes to people's lives. Keep supporting and recognizing your volunteers as I know you do. I hope what I've said has given you some food for thought. I'd be delighted afterwards to take some questions. But I want to give some of our volunteers the last word and leave you with a challenge. With appropriate support, could some of the volunteers that you're about to see volunteer for you? My name is Andrew. My name is David. My name's Anthony. Peter. Oh. I volunteer at Escape on a Thursday. And I come here on a Thursday. And um. I am the volunteer in Matters of Escape. I volunteer Escape. A big lot, man. It's, it's volunteers. The bench. I do weeding, sometimes painting. Mm -hmm. Do garden, is it? Yeah. And pick them rubbish up. Not to dig in, weeding, watering. I like come to escape. Because I'll, I like it here. Yeah, lovely place to come. I like the people here. Hi guys, you alright? My name's Anthony Aspring and I work here at St. Charity Shop. My main guy here was meant to be, well, it's Monday, but now I'm so popping here, they want me here at Monday and Friday. I think I, I work on killing many, I get um, customers to say come in. 
and also when I need working on Kira help me in my math skills. I mean, I mean, if you work on Kira, you've got to know what K how much change to give, and nothing you kill will tell me what change I have to give. I mean, we are getting a new kill very soon, so hopefully I'll be able to do a card payment as well. I hope you um, find this video very helpful and hope you would like a drawing from Kiwi Matters. My name is Jessica, I'm working at the Volunteering Cat Sanctuary. Hello, I'm Stephen and I'm volunteering, volunteering at the Cat Sanctuary. I like washing up. Wash up and making sure it's all nice and clean. I like playing with the cat, yeah. give him all the fuss, yeah. brush him. And be and be the cat. And the cat thanks me is a good is a good place to volunteer. My name is Lisa Freestein and I volunteer at Choose Yard. I, I, I work on the till and I uh, take the money and and I show people uh, where to go around the museum. I, 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 I love coming here. It, yeah. it, it, it's one of my favourite uh, places to work. So it's not a coincidence that I chose that for the last uh, contribution, um, but many thanks for listening to me, and I'm happy to take some uh, questions. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, just before we take the questions, um, how many volunteers are in the room? That's quite a few, actually. Um, and, and are there any museums here who have employed disabled, well, employed, um, are using disabled volunteers or employing disabled? Right. Are you surprised, Una? I'm, I'm not particularly surprised, no, because I think there's more, I think there's more of the kind of uh, volunteering that I was speaking about out there than you know, we realise. And uh, could I urge you to get closer to one mic? Uh, maybe it's just because I'm on the stage, but I'm not hearing you so well. But you're, 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 not, you're not surprised. You know there's some, quite a bit out there. Yeah. Okay. Well, can we have some questions? I mean, I suppose particularly from people who've got some experience uh, of this far away. Um, where have we got microphones in the room, have we? Can the people with microphones wave them around a bit so I believe you're there? Standing mics. You mean people have to reveal themselves and come out? They have to physically move. <laughs> Are you joking? <clears throat> okay. Right. Come on, everybody. Jump up and get to the mics. Then it's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> You're just not going with the flow of who folk are, are you? Um, well, come on. Come to the mics, folks. Hey. Eh? <laughs> oh, hello. It's really close to the wall here. I'm just I, I know. Yeah, good, good for Hello. you. Just move the stuff around a bit. <laughs> if I guess a wee song, if you want, you know. Okay, hi. <laughs> My name's Sarah Levitt, and we have lots of volunteers at Leicester Museums, but I would like to pay tribute to affluent volunteers and able volunteers, as well as the ones who they have a great deal of pleasure helping. I'm a huge fan of Rotary, and I'd like to pay tribute to the work that Rotary Club does as a source of volunteers, particularly the work they do with young people, which is Rotaract. And it's certainly helped my daughter. But I think there's a role for volunteering for absolutely everybody, whatever your skills, and not even, not even including the ABC ones. Thanks. Good. Let's take a couple of questions. Look, this, this is catching, isn't it? So are you, you've got a question. And now we're going to do that pantomime thing, because we're coming into the season, folk. What about that side of the room? Come on, that side of the room. We need somebody down there. Now, come on. But meantime, let's hear, look at two people from this side of the room. Right, that's three people in case it's difficult to count after last night. Three people on this side of the room, not one over there, okay? So before, after we've had these two folk, we must have one there. So, on you go. Hi, um, I'm Danielle Garcia. I'm the uh, volunteer programme manager for Imperial War Museum North. And it's really just to shed light on um, a wonderful volunteering for wellbeing programme that's uh, a partnership programme with the Manchester Museum. And 
museums are truly reflective and inspiring places for people uh, to improve their well-being. And the programme that we de developed um, recruits people that are long-term unemployed, people with disabilities, young people, um, and people in, at risk of isolation. And it's really been an amazing three-year programme. So please do go on to the website, www.volunteeringforwellbeing.org.uk. Um, we've had some amazing impact from the projects. Um, we did a social return on investment, and we found that for every one pound invested in the programme, it generates £3.50 in social and economic value. Um, 40, well, 48% of volunteers have continued with us uh, volunteering, but 28% um, have moved on into employment or opportunities for employment. It's not an employability programme, it's a volunteering for wellbeing programme, but it's quite a high number for that. And it's really just to say, yes, it takes time, it takes investment and support and resource. We were given a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund, but museums are great spaces to support people for wellbeing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. Oh, look. Right, come on, girl. No, hang on, this is too exciting. Wait a minute. This side, right. Go for it, girl. Hello. Um, I'm Victoria Gabatas from Rugby Art Gallery and Museum, but I also um, i am the mentor for Piddington Roman Villa Museum, which is a volunteer-run museum. And obviously they have a lot of volunteers. Uh, what I'd really like to know is, does anybody have a magic bullet to deal with the question of succession planning? Uh, because... Um, all these little organisations uh, like Piddington Roman Villa Museum, um, the age just ever goes up. Getting people in younger is increasingly difficult, it seems, and it, it's just a recurring problem. Mm -hmm. Magic okay. bullets, please. Right, thank you very much for that. And just to say, finally, that you know the same Blake that we're seeing about, about women doing most of the volunteering is true of these questions. <laughs> Guys... So, you know, we need a guy now over that side of the room, and then I'll be really happy and you can all have your coffee, right? Yes. Oh, look, we've got two folk here, you see, it just keeps going on and on. Right, on you go. I'm Moira Sinclair from the Paul Hamlin Foundation. In a previous life, I used to run a theatre, and I think one of the anxieties about volunteers is a, um, a sneaking suspicion that it's somehow going to subvert your mission in some way, particularly friends volunteering types <laughs> programmes where the friends can start to have a life of their own. So mine, mine is a provocation, really, about how you work with directors and, and trustees of organisations to make sure they understand what the benefits of volunteering are and how you mitigate against that sense that somehow the volunteers might start to take on a, a life of their own outside of the mission of your organisation. Mm -hmm. OK, still an empty podium there. And last remark from you. Um, it's a question. Um, I'm a freelance project uh, coordinator, so I work with museums uh, or, or different places. And often the projects, so there's two projects at the moment that like a two-year duration. Um, one's heritage, one's art. And you build up a really, over that time, a temporary sudden little group of volunteers. And then often you as a project disappear and um, maybe leave this newly activated things, and that, these, these people who may continue to do things in their community there, but I'm wondering how I, as a freelance project person, can, or maybe I just signpost people to volunteering matters. It's just that, uh, it's that energy of when you're not actually in a building or a cultural organization, you're a temporary project, new energy, new people volunteer, and then you often leave them, how best to uh, feed them into this, to the core. I don't know, it's a kind of a question to myself. No, that's okay. It came out the other way. That's I did fine. It good, good. <clears throat> Listen, in any case, you've done better than every man in the room, you know? <laughs> Come on. There's got to be one guy. Come on, you're going to be treated like a hero. <laughs> yes, there you go, you see? As soon as the word hero's up there, then somebody jumps up. They always do. Right, we're all on the edge of our seats, right, to know who you are. Okay, my name's Peter Ride, and I teach a museum studies course, and I'm going to kind of add a different element to it. Most of my students volunteer. They, they take in internships or they volunteer, and burnout is a real issue for them. They volunteer because it's the only way they can get a job, 
and they know they need about, they, I teach in London, University of Westminster, they know they need about two years voluntary work before they can get employed in the sector, otherwise their CVs aren't going to be solid enough. But it's an issue. It's an issue that they're working with organisations where they're cautious about being exploited, and so they need to be working organisations which are very respectful of what kind of, you know, short-term volunteers can give them. But, but, but I do deal with students or ex-students who cannot cope after two years because they're earning money through casual work, doing bar work, you know, stuff like that, to, f to pay for their volunteering. So we need a culture within museums which actually supports this kind of growing community of people who are next generation's professionals who are going to come into it through this route. Sorry, it's not really a question. I'm no, that was well to... worth waiting for. Um, great. Right, well, look, thank you for that bundle. And I hope you've been scribbling away with the things that you want to pick up on, because there's everything there from, you know, casual work needed to support volunteering, which is probably a reality, right through to that sustain, um, succession planning plea. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, thanks very much for that. Just maybe a few reflections. Um, I think when you come to give a, a, a contribution to a conference like this, you, you do always have to strike a, a really careful balance between not patronising your audience, and I hope I didn't do that, because I know that there's loads and loads of good stuff uh, going on in the museums and creative, uh, creative sector. Um, and I suppose my, my plea was a plea to all of us in, the, in, in any sector was to do more. It wasn't specifically um, that the idea that nothing was happening um, in the sector. And like the very first speaker, I, I, I really value our older white middle class volunteers. You know, they, they're the ones that, that keep a lot of our programs going. Um, so anything I said wasn't meant to be a, a criticism of them. You know, let them, let them come in their numbers. Um, I think the volunteering for well-being, really, really uh, well-made point. Um, I just think, as I said, that we don't shout loud enough about that. Um, and, and that's where, and I, I'm sorry to keep harping on about this, but I think that's where we need to hear the volunteer voices. We need to hear people say, this thing that I do makes me feel much better. It's improved my health. You know, if, if I go back to my, my Middlesbrough example where we have the, the men's health project, um, some of these guys have actually got tangible health improvements, weight loss, blood pressure dropping, um, fitness increasing, all of these things, but really tangible things, not, not just, you know, I kind of feel better in myself. Um, so I think that it's important that we shout about that. Um, succession planning, well, as you, can, as you heard me say, it's on the minds of some of our older volunteers as well. Um, I don't have a magic bullet. Um, I think all I can say is what we try to do is um, make our opportunities really attractive, provide the volunteers with structure, with job descriptions, with support, with training, with all of these things which they, they want, um, and try to attract and retain them in that way. Um, the, the question about subverting the mission is a really interesting one because I think maybe when I started in, in what was community service volunteers, um, we might have felt there was a bit of that going on in certain areas. Um, there was a kind of, the volunteers are getting a bit too much power here, you know, they're, they're, they're starting to dictate policy and, well, why shouldn't they in lots of ways? You know, it's their organisation. Um, you've, got to, you've got to keep it in, in, in a certain amount of check. You've got to make, it, make sure that it, 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 it fits still with your, with your mission and your vision and that your, your trustees um, understand all of that. But, but the best way I've found <coughs> of, um, of working with the, with the governance of my charity, certainly, but I'm sure it applies elsewhere, is to get these trustees out Get them out to see the projects, get them out to see what volunteers are doing, get them out to meet the volunteers, even more important, and get them out to talk to the volunteers, and again, listen to their voices, get the volunteers to tell them exactly what it's like to volunteer for the organisation. Um, and lots of good ideas come from that, uh, as you know. Um, the whole issue of um, internships and the voluntary work thing very much resonates with us. We, um, as an organisation, we do have interns. We pay them the London living wage. Um, I think that's the, absolutely the least that uh, we can do. We, we generally only have them in our, our London uh, projects and in the London, um, in the London office. Um, I do think the full-time volunteer, I would say this of course, but I do think the full-time volunteering option where there is support, there's, there's, um, there's 
accommodation, there's subsistence, there's some, uh, there's some money. It's a really great way, <coughs> excuse me, for, um, for young people to get some of that experience. Um, the, the young chap I was talking to yesterday, um, whom I've just signed up as a, as a poster boy for our full-time volunteering, um, it spoke very articulately about that, and he said, you know, everybody now gets their degree and they're just desperate to get into the labour market. Um, and once, they're, once they've got a job or once they've, they've got a flat, they've got a commitment, they can't, they've just got to keep going. He said more young people, and um, this is him speaking, not me, should maybe just take a step back and think, what could I do? I've got time on my hands, which of course you don't, you don't realise when you're in your 20s. I've got time on my hands. I could be do something, I could do something that both um, could further my career, could give me new skills, um, could give me a very, very different experience. It could take me away from home if that's what I want. Um, but uh, maybe, you know, we should be looking to have some of these full-time volunteers placed with you in museums across the country because I've, so I say to my staff uh, a lot of the time, all of our full-time volunteers don't want to do health and social care volunteering. Some of them want to do other kinds of volunteering and we don't have nearly enough or nearly as wide a diversity of full-time volunteering places uh, that, than, than we should have and that, than young people want. So maybe that's an area of work that I could be talking to the Museums Association about in the future. Did I cover everything? Great. Okay. And j just exactly on time. Well, could I ask you to thank Una. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.